morning. I'm happy to begin the very first session of the third day of Doctors in Performance. And we are about to have four very interesting presentations. Uh, I'm Rasam Ruskaite from Lithuanian Academy of Music and Theatre, and I will be chairing this session. And the very first of the presenters is Vincent Kairs from Lucan School of Arts. And I his recital is called It's the Score Stupid, the transition from contemporary percussion score to audiovisual electroacoustic improvisation. All right, good morning. Uh, I'm Vincent, so I'm going to do this performance with my partner here, Sigrid. She's going to do the visual stuff. We're first going to play about half an hour, and then I'm going to shortly explain how I got here from a contemporary percussion score.
Right. So, um, if you just saw, was a small improvisation set, and basically I have been playing uh, Loops 2 by Philippe Cruvel, for those who know this composition. Um, what I'm shortly going to explain is how we got to this way of performing. We're going to go shortly through the piece so you know what is in there. Uh, the way I practiced was very important to get to this position, and then how it was implemented in this kind of set. For those who don't know Philippe Hurel, he's a French composer, uh, spectralism, um, he had lessons with uh, Tristan Murail, but he was also very much interested in the classical variation techniques. Now those two things, spectralism, classical variation techniques, they have a, a sort of inherent paradox because in spectralism you have like you have the idea of the continuous transformation, which is influenced by the analysis of a sound file or a, 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 sort, a sound. But in classical vari uh, yeah, the continuous transformation from the analysis of a sound, but that means that there's actually no repetition possible in a strict sense. While if you have classical variation, we all know this is heavily dependent on uh, repetition. So uh, Philippe Rell has been looking to solve that kind of paradox. And his series of loops compositions is like a study of five compositions in which he sort of finds a way to combine those two ideas in what I call the repetition with continuous transformation. So the basic idea is he sort of has a cell which starts transforming. So it's a sort of repetition, but it's fragment. Each repetition has like a fragmentary way of deconstructing or reconstructing a cell. Mm -hmm. uh, he puts his focus on transparency on a process, which is very important for him, uh, which will be later clear why I practiced it in this way. And for me, after analyzing the piece, I had like, there were multiple layers in there. And that was actually the, the core point for me from the comp for the composition, that you still have this continuous transformation, which is more present on the meso and the macro level. level. While on the micro level, there is actually this sort of very fast and repeti repetitive music. So first, for a short overview, you should think of the micro level as, as all the m musical parameters in a motif, which is repeated, makes sense. And then they start fragmentarily changing while the motif gets repeated. And fragmentarily, um, I mean, you have a small motif, which he, Hurel actually sort of improvised for himself for starting out. And then they, each parameter can change in a sort of strict way, and it's on small fragments of the of the, the motif. So like one note can get like a little bit longer, another one can like do does a pitch change in one, two, or three semitones, or an octave transposition, or a combination of both. Anyway, and in that way, the music evolves, and basically you have two directions. So um, mostly we start with the, the the pieces start with a motif, and you get like a regressive direction, which means he sort of like deconstructs the motive until he has like a very small cell left and then he starts constructing it again so motion or the evolution goes in the other way um, now it's not always that each parameter is going in that they all are going in one way or the other so you get like a, a mixture of these evolutions but on the mesa level it's the overall presence of one of those of those two which actually gives like the transformation and evolution on the mesa level and then on the micro level he creates this kind of big repetitive structures so basically this is a whole piece of loops too it's a vibraphone solo you see it's centered around the main motive you have like a big loop departing and going back but in those loops you have again smaller loops and so basically three loops each time i mean the, the image is clear um, and the green ones are constructive periods the red arrows are the regressive period and for me when analyzing and practicing the piece, it was this tension between those two elements, like the small, very fast, repetitive motives and these gradual, slow transformations, which made the piece interesting for me. So this is a, oh, it's not a very good projection now, but you, this is like the first, actually what you should see, <coughs> the loop A, so the top loop is these two pages. And actually each period is one of those colored colored uh, schemes. So that was the first thing I did, mapping this process on my score, so I can good to have it like visually present when I was practicing. And then the second thing I did was to get the micro level clear. I sort of re rearranged each small period. So it's maybe not completely clear, but if you take the green one here, then that's this score. And this side is actually the constructive period. So you can see like he starts with this, this F sharp, F G motive, which is gradually growing till you have this element. And he starts back from there and he sort of deconstructs it back till this 
small part here. So you get like an exchange of those two directions in music. But as you can see, the, the rhythmical, or maybe you can't see it very clear, but the rhythmical changes, for example, are, are really small. So you could go like from the 32nd notes where one group gets to a triplet of, uh, uh, yeah, a triplet of 30 seconds, or I don't know if I have image here, but for example, within a period like one of a 30 second quintuplet gets in and gets out. And uh, I mean, it's very strict. So for me, it was one of the important things to first grasp like in a strict way how the evolution is going before I could interpret the piece. And as a solution, I developed a sort of personal click track device uh, connected with a sequencer. So I could really like strictly practice with it. And I could really sense how the music was evolving, even if I was practicing in a slow way that I had like a rigid structure for myself. And once I got, I got the, the, the music actually or the process in my, in my body and my performance, I could start really interpreting it. So once I could play the piece and I was performing and I did other pieces from Murel in the same way, but I felt like the, the thing which interested me a lot was um, this, this tension between those two elements. But a lot of people were lacking that in a performance. They sort of only got connected to the, the upper layer, the micro level, the fast changes. So the music was very intense. And only when I started explaining how the music worked, it's like, oh yeah, maybe it's there or I need to listen to it again, which makes sense if you take the, I don't know if you know the work of Margalis who says like well, repetitive exposure to the same music, you get deeper into it. But as a contemporary performer, you don't often get the possibility of like reperforming the piece multiple times for the same people. So I was looking for ways of getting the tension back in the music. And that was when I started working with Sigrid on actually trying to create a slow visual process in real time happening on the music. So this is a short video fragment where we had actually sort of finished with loops, where we had like the team, which is the stripes and, and the, the big color here. And then Sigrid was sort of a slow way trying to implement this, this similar constructive and regressive period, which worked particularly well with the paint and the water to implement that into, uh, onto, onto the playing. And then we had like a slow experience visually while the music was going fast underneath. Then when we were, I mean, I was very interested in this music, which obviously makes sense if you hear me here, but we wanted to explore further working with this kind of connection between each other. So we started to leave the music, at least for me, it was important to leave the score behind because that was still a, a sort of rigid way. And we wanted to try to improvise basically with, with the kind of the way the loops work. And then I bumped into my own limitations with my brain because the way loops works, it's just, it's not possible to really create them on the fly. You should sort of get a stack of what you're doing, being able to rewind it in a way to end up again. And that's be pretty difficult. But then I found a solution inspired by this guy. So this is Ligeti sitting in between his Poem Symphonique setup, which is basically a piece for 100 metronomes. And I had like a metronome which was capable of doing these kind of changes and stuff. So I transformed my practice tool into this tool, which is what I was now playing with. So basically this is a sort of sequencing, a generative sequencer, where I can put eight patterns in, um, and this is maybe a little clearer. So there I have like eight patterns which are running, which uh, I can put in like complex rhythms. So I made a notation where I could have similar things. And what you see here is actually the main motive of loops two. So that was my starting point. And then you see the section over there, and that's actually what the composition is doing. So I can set for each parameter how it should change, uh, which restrictions it can take, which directions, if it should go constructive, regressive, if it should like diverge of getting closer. And when it's running, it will start changing itself. So I can set up a pattern, I can let it run. I can say, okay, now you have to go that way, you have to go that way. And that was what I was doing on this one. Um, and that information is then sent, I can do it to virtual instruments, which I didn't use today, but I can also send it to custom samplers. So I could actually reimpose that process again on my own playing, which you heard when I was doing vibraphone uh, or the noisy sound file, which I started with. And then on another level, I implemented a, an analyzer system where the patterns are sort of aware of themselves. So I could 
tell them like you have to stay around this section and so the the system itself can decide if it needs to go constructive or regressive so i could even back up more once it's running and i can just keep playing and so what you actually hear today everything i used was loops too so the patterns which i started with were all parts of the composition like starting points for a constructive loop or departing points for a regressive loop which i recalled and then let it run and what i played on the vibraphone was not the fast stuff but all the notes were also coming from loops too so for me we just continued playing the piece and that's something which i really like what i'm actually exploring in my phd work is how can i like continue working with the pieces i really like except for just playing once in a while those eight minutes so basically that was what uh, you heard today thank you for listening i don't know if you have questions time yes we have 10 minutes right, for cool. questions thank you very much uh we actually have 10 minutes so if you have some questions we are open for the discussion everybody is just amazed <laughs> So it's no early in the morning, you know. <laughs> so, no questions. Yes, uh, maybe uh, I think two things I should use with the... Uh, oh, oh, are you doing real time with the music? How am I really... Uh, That's really the question really we really discussed really yesterday. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, first of all, I'm a painter. Uh, it was... Uh, it took me years to understand that I don't have to make a nice painting, which is made in five seconds. <laughs> and I take another page and I have another new beautiful painting. So I had to start thinking with time. That was very difficult and new for me. Normally I work very solo in my studio alone and I have time to think and everything what I do is what I want to do, is how my vision is. And now I have to deal with time and with someone who is building something up. That's music. So there is a new layer as a painter, that's the layer of time. So I had to... So that took me a lot of time not to think on the product, but on the process. That was something who is coming into Paint, uh, painting language. If I uh, can jump yeah. on the question, yeah. Um, yeah. because uh, we discussed all yeah. by coincidence yesterday. That's another part which I didn't touch here, which I'm also actually heavily searching, is, is what, what happens when you put yourself as a sound artist or a musician in a multimedia section. So there's a lot changing uh, in, in ways of what, what is being experienced by the people for who you're performing this multimedia stuff. So this is basically a multimedia performance. And so I've been diving into, uh, I mean, there is a, st a strand of, of research into multimedia and uh, uh, multimedia research, but most of them are analytical models. So you have like the early uh, film studies with, with Michel Chong and, and his uh, audiovisual counterpoint, where he has an idea of how in what he calls synthesis is close or not. And you can create sort of counterpoint in there. And then you have Nicholas Cook, his, his connection with uh, conformance, complementary and contrast models, where basically what we are searching for is more the complementary model, where you, like the conformant model is like you, you like sync everything, which is, is basically what you have if you're in the club dancing and the kick flashes with strobo and the, the, I mean, that's very conformant. But that's not what we're looking for. You have the contrast model where you really have the image fighting with what you're, with, with the sound, for example. And basically what we are looking is more like what complementary is, is that you're trying to with the two instances of multimedia, which is sound and image, in a way like that. And that's a bit what we're trying with this process ID. Like I I started out with this fasting and then Sigrid had the slow one. And then the last interesting model I find is the Lars Ellestrom's ID, uh, who basically went against what was uh, say what was what was common and that when he was writing where everyone tries to find what is the difference between multimedia between instances of multimedia and how do they create a new meaning layer which cook calls because there is a new room ex uh, originating where uh, meaning can be generated and elstrom like said you know we should first see what all instances of multimedia can have common and then he divides it into four levels and like what secret told the, the third level is basically the four dimensions which is yeah 
I mean, the, the 3D plus time. And so for each multimedia instance, you can see like, where are they working in there? So the first one is a sort of physical level. The second one is more the, uh, the senses and the perception and everything is a neurological idea. The third one is one where I think we as artists can start working with is this four dimension. And I see it already explained. If you have, have like a painting, which is two dimensions, and if you use perspective, you can use a third dimension, which is then in the virtual space. But basically, there's no time involved. So time is added here. And what I'm now with electronics a bit trying to do is, can I create more of a space idea? So somehow like static blocks in which the small movement is happening. And those blocks can like slowly evolve, but give a static image where I can sort of create the other dimension, except from time. But time is the only thing I can use for sound because you can't do sound without time, of course. So that's a bit the way we are trying to match processes that we're sort of like trying to get this kind of way of working. And then you can get to the fourth level, which is the semiotic level, which we actually have a feeling from now. We are not really consciously working on that yet. Let's first do what, what we now have and leave the experience for people watching it. So, but one of the problems with, with those models is they're all analytical. So they all take a, a multimedia product and they start analyzing its components. Uh, what I'm trying to find is a way of, of turning those around to see like, okay, if we're actively creating multimedia on the spot, what are strategies we could try to use? So that's another part in my PhD work, which I not, didn't really touch on, but I was expecting this question, so I was prepared. <laughs> so what would be the next step then for you? Well, basically we're, we're for me, it's, it's really now trying to have a sense of, I think we're, we're getting somewhere now, but I don't feel it's ready. Like, I don't feel like this is it yet. So it, it's still that work, like how can we sort of move together and, and even create more of a chamber music way with, between image and sound, but without falling into the, the most obvious way, which is like, I paint something, I give a kick. Because that's again the conformant thing, which works very well. I mean, it's very clear for everyone. It's not exactly the kind of experience I'm looking. It's more, could you have, could you reinforce the, the experience of this kind of complex compositions or this kind of improvisations in a way that the experience gets stronger if I put image on there and what should I as a musician which is my spot and which is the image spot so basically that's what we're looking for to get like I mean I wasn't in that seat I was playing so to have an idea of what, what is the experience of it and, and does it get stronger if I if I for example put away this does it get stronger or, or weaker or if this is doing something completely different or I'm doing something what happens then and getting that a bit clearer is like the task for the next year. Yeah, the, the, what we want is to make the painting a layer in music that, uh, that, uh, that uh, the audience start to hear something when I make a line. That, that your association is becoming music when you see a dot or a color. You start associating like in musical way, in musical language. So and I do versa. not, yes, I, and, and that's, yeah. And um, so this is not an illustration and the music is not an illustration of the painting, but it's, it's another layer in one, in one language. And we have time for one more question. Just the last thing I want to add to this question. Okay. Yeah. Just, just the next step for me is based on my interest in these loop compositions is I now have a way of imposing the process on sound. So one of the things I want to explore, with, which is possible with these technologies, can I impose this on image, for example? Can I find a way of really, like, yeah, it's not physically because it happens in the computer, but, but having this composition process also in processing the image in a way which makes sense. So, okay, last question. Question, yeah. Last question, uh, and uh, I like also very much in the way your approach is, is more intuitive and reacting to each other, but uh, I saw some performances uh, mm, uh, where, uh, sensors or technology is used uh, so that, uh, for instance, uh, each stroke of the painting could impact on the sound or, or transform the sound somehow so that there is like a direct connection. Yeah. Have you ever been interested in that? Yeah, yeah. but mm -hmm. the, the big trap you have there is that you easily get into a, a really conformant model so that she makes a stroke and you hear or I would more like we're, we're chamber music, like in chamber music, you're like your partner does something or in chamber music improvisation, not, not score. 
like your partner does something, can I go along? Can I contrast with it? Performing it, not not just. And the thing what I have in that way is, is indeed what I tell like, if the system is running and you could have like this thing controlling both of them, then then you have another way of, of doing that kind of mappings because eventually it's all about mappings that kind of, of situations and, and you can go either any way uh, but you still have to deal with everything I theoretically said earlier which is still finding out how to do it active like what basically why why are you mapping a stroke on a, on a sine wave thank you very much thank you Vincent thank you Sigrid we are about to have a five minutes break that our technicians need to switch up a little bit and then we I will be uh, introducing the second presenter okay So I would like to present the second presenter of the session. We are about to hear the lecture recital of Adelia Yip, uh, Royal Conservatoire of Antwerp of his Institute, University of Antwerp. And she, uh, her uh, subject is describe experience the artistic research on cross-cultural music practices. Yeah, um, I, I should apologize for this technical makeover. Uh, it's always the life of a percussionist is making things, building things, breaking up things, ongoing. Um, yes, uh, I'm now in the stage of uh, preparing my defense in October. So actually, I'm overwhelmed with so much information. And I, I think in this talk, I am not able to bring everything up. Uh, but if you have a question and anything I don't explain well, just ask, email, or yes. Um, the central aim of this research is to explore the potential of enriching the music practice of the uh, Western classical world and the Western percussion repertoire by investigating the West African battle for music. Um, these aims sound simple at first, as I thought that taking some battle for lessons, surfing on the internet, watching some YouTube, listening to some CD recordings will help me will give me the substantial sources for creativity and analysis. However, it, it didn't really work that way. Um, I got some inspiration until I visited Africa and I experienced the music culture over there. The experience of engaging as a musician in totally new ways of playing music and different modes of learning have given me theoretical and philosophical insights. I felt like I was standing between two worlds at a cross point the world of mine and the world of the African. It was like this. I am a Chinese, you say that. I live in Europe. I uh, grew up in a Chinese environment. I learned uh, Western, uh, Western classical music all my life. <coughs> and this made me who I am. And this is a way of shaping my experience in Africa. And on the other hand, the prejudice that filtered and masked how I can understand them. And that's something I think I'm quite obliged. It was a cluster between traditions, but what it gave me was more than a musical material perspective. And the experience was grounded in human encounters that require a thorough communication and understanding of the music practice, viewpoints, customs, and social behavior. So it was a field study uh, two times in Africa, first time in 2012 <coughs> in Mali and the second time in Burkina Faso. And I studied with the same uh, group of teachers, uh, Yusuf Keita and Ali um, Kasum Keita. Ali Keita is a big star in Europe. Uh, he's from there, but I couldn't meet him. And he's the big brother of, of this uh, duo. Uh, so I would like to show a video of how balafon sounds. Ah, by the way, the photo is so it's a it's a front side of of the balafon, and and these are a so so the instrument is made of resonator of um, natural um, calabash, which is like they emptied the fruit, and so the shell is enabled to resonate the wooden slates, and it's a pentatonic instrument played with two mallets. 
one in each hand. And so the performance, it was taken in a church. Is it both? and I filmed it in a church. So it was uh, the real situation that how they apply the instrument and the music. Um, so it's an ensemble uh, with, I think, around two to three ballot things. I don't remember so clearly anymore. And it was a lot of drums and two groups of choir in the back as call and response. And so, One? The pointer. Can, can I have the, the, the two ones? The first oh, one. Oh, okay. From there. This one? Or? Uh, up one, yeah. This one? Yes. Okay. <laughs> to teach us yeah. to play the melody yeah. in the right hand yeah. and not to play it with our duck but with an, a comping left hand. Okay. Like we know from the sound of duck, you remember? <laughs> <laughs> it's exactly the yeah. same. So what? It's difficile. circumstances, I, I've used a multidisciplinary research model that integrates research methods with ethnomusicology and phenomenology as a result. Uh, the two ethnomusicological tools Learning and participant observation have offered me the experience of being in the Balfour music practice. I could have learned the music by reading transcriptions and writings of African scholars, uh, but the feeling and sensation of the music required the involvement in the practice and the culture. The head-on experience of the music gave me the insights of how the music 
could be played and understood. By submitting myself to be part of the practice, I experienced these criteria. Oral tradition, as I tried to explain, um, the African music thinking, by manual coordination, like Yusuf trying to teach us, uh, the holistic teaching approach, cyclical rhythmic structure. That I don't have time to really explain, but I, I see the rhythm patterns are synchronized as a big circle, you just keep turning. And they don't necessarily start at, uh, at the same point as in the Western music, like if it's 4-4, four, four, then music have one, two, three, four as the metrical uh, division. That's, that's very clear, but in the African concept, it's, it's more vague, I have to say. Um, and the embodied musical movements and the personality in music. Through music creation and my dissertation, I recorded and interpreted these experiences of my mind and my body. These are the process of sensing, thinking, or even dreaming in the music. Since the stage of data collection, I began to reveal how I, the performer researcher, responded to the African music culture. While following every instruction given by the African teachers, I have maintained my subjective character. As a Western classically trained marimbist, I did not attempt to go native, to act like an African, to become an African balafonist. I, I think it's simply not possible. Since my purpose is to reflect on the process of adopting the balafon techniques and practices, and to be able to discuss the changes in my own artistic perspective and create new music with these experiences, such detachment from the balafon helped me to obtain a comparative approach in his research. So this phenomenological approach is continued in the process of rendering the experiential feeling of a foreign music practice. Um, the interpretation of the research findings is are pertained to the idiosyncrasy of the artist researcher in which my tasks and methods are depending on my specific artistic research interest. For instance, I have chosen to obtain my knowledge through performing and learning the balafon by immersing myself in African practice, whereas the central aim of a composer is an analysis of the musical forms and adaptation of these ideas in his or her compositions. A linguist and ethnomusicologist could perhaps investigate the diffusion history of a particular African instrument by tracking the history of the people's language usage. I have to articulate in a more systematic way the inevitable experience of playing music, which means how actually I strike. I, I think with all instrumentalists, somehow it's not always easy to explain this experience, such as like the music embodiment the know-how of playing the instrument, learning by ear, ear and the experience of switching between two music practices. The focal point is the interpretation of my experiential knowledge of the valuable music practice. So I should cut the speaking shorter and I begin to play my repertoire. And I've been working with five uh, young composers. Uh, they were really kind to accept my findings, uh, my uh, explanations, and they use it in the compositional process. The first piece is Inner Side Etudes.
So please, inner side A2. Yeah, yeah I, I should have shown this. Uh, it is a piece of 11, 11 movements, and I only presented the first three. So I was walking towards the shadow, where I, I was with a slap mallet like this uh, to create how I approach a shadow to approach an unknown. And the second is five senses of fire. It was short moments of how I think about fire on spot and the last is lullaby. Lullaby is actually kind of a reflection of what the fire was but have to be with mallet. Um, it is actually we call it a sensory performance and it's a game piece. Uh, the other movements was with duo um, and with other uh, extended techniques with the bow or with more different things and there should be uh, the other player is at the back of the audience to create a response with me. So we try to um, uh, express how, how a performer had to experience in an, a no musical environment. Uh, of course, we reformed everything. It's, it's not an imitation of Balafon and I actually should apply better the playing technique for the Balafon but today is a little bit I think it's still early in the morning. And eyesight is a sense that we relied on playing on this instrument. It's, as a marimbas or percussionist, it, we are defined by the space. The instrument with all these keys, I, I have to know which position I am, or the ori orientation. If I don't have sight, I actually don't really know where I'm standing, but it is a kind of sensation, it is a feeling that we embodied over the years so actually without eyesight is a, is a critical pro uh, question. Is it really a problem? I think if I, yeah, if I really practice this piece every day, I think I could play pretty much complicated classical repertoire. It should be possible. Um, and of course, it was an experience for me in, in Africa that I was changing from a pentatonic instrument to back to this chromatic instrument I was switching. Uh, of course, I, I don't have a balafong today, but if I have to change it immediately, actually it's, it's quite difficult because the space is different. Um, the definition change, the feeling of the instrument change. And now I would like to present the second piece of the program. I please allow me to take this thing off. Yes. Can you borrow your paper for a second? Yeah. 
And now here comes the second piece. It's for Sound Portrait 5. It's, it's a collaboration with Enric. Enric, at that time, he was also doing his PhD in composition. And it's a joint venture between us. Um, so, Sound Portrait 5. 5 is chrono chronologically is, a, is the fifth uh, piece of, of this um, composition uh, project for his PhD. So I was researching the potential to use movement patterns as a communicative tool in the marimba repertoire. And for him, it was an investigation to find out a co-creative partnership between the composer and the interpreter. The result is an open format, a graphical score of dot, line, and time scale. The piece is divided into three parts. The composition builds up from a texture of two mallets to four mallets. And uh, it is a free improvisation actually based on this graph. Uh, the combined, in the end, the materials, the last movement is uh, combining materials from the first two parts. Or I, I have to suggest uh, ideas that he didn't include in the first two movements. So this graphical score gave me the guidelines of moving around the uh, easier phone keyboard. That's a generic name for instrument. And I'm given the liberty to choose the best materials. Notes, harmony, rhythm and tempo to realize my ideas or overdrive. Um, the camera, we spent so much effort to fix it. It's actually, I want to show the, the patterns of my movements on the instrument and that you can't see it from the front. It, it's just different shapes.
question in short. Thank you. See you later. Okay, thank you. We have still time for one or two very short questions. So if you want to ask something to Adelia, please do it now. If there is no questions, thank you very much yes, for a very interesting uh, lecture recital. And I would like to introduce the third uh, presenter of this session. It's Paul Livorsis from Sibelius Academy, University of the Arts, Helsinki. And she will be presenting the paper Human Voice and Instrumental Sound Embedded Perception and Performative Space.
free. <laughs> you, you feel something again or? No, I just, uh, I have this light. Okay, thank you for being here. I'm sorry for the technical problems, and um, and uh, thank you also to Mantras and, and to this uh, innovation center uh, in Vilnius. Actually, it's my second time here, or I was here this spring uh, for the international workshop uh, uh, Nord Plus Mix uh, uh, about uh, uh, like a special sound ambisonics and um, and so very nice to be here um yeah uh, my subject uh, involves uh, uh, like uh, um, human voice and uh, instrumental sound um and um, actually mm, uh, well my background is a is a composer and uh, also uh, in my studies as a violin player and uh, this question had arisen along the years from my practice too. Uh, that is, uh, sometimes uh, you can uh, start uh, to hear in, in some way uh, your own voice resonance in the instrument. And, and this is something that uh, I thought about and I noticed over the years also in my practice uh, of a composer when uh, working with uh, string instrument players. And, uh, and then I had this idea, why not to start an artistic research on this, on this subject. And what interested me, uh, especially in uh, human voice, um, uh, it is uh, that uh, it uh, stems from the body uh, and it is uh, very individual. As we know, like uh, every uh, speaker has a, a, a different uh, 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 sound depending on the on the, the phonatory system which is different for uh, everybody the same and different um, and uh, and so on so so um, yes uh, and in these uh, body aspects uh, there are also also other aspects uh, that is uh, everyone has uh, a personal way uh, to speak uh, and to have gestures poses and and it all impacts in this and, and it is very connected with identity and um, and uh, um, uh, I came across with this very interesting book by Adriana Cavarero uh, that um, from more than one voice um, that uh, uh, draw, uh, is uh, analyzing uh, like uh, how West Western culture uh, um, sees uh, this subject uh, in a way uh, because uh, because uh, she says uh, like Western culture is uh, mainly video centric and logo centric and so when we think that the term uh, uh, idea idea comes from the Greek uh, ideo I see uh, so so we see that uh, there is a, a strong connection between the concept and uh, and the visual representation and this uh, is very present in our culture and she says uh, somehow uh, the sound uh, and especially the voice or the, the first sound that comes from ourselves um, uh, can put a bit uh, a bit aside um, is, is put a bit aside in our in our culture and we would need to to rediscover like uh, the logos vivified through the uh, throat of flesh and uh, and also come back to some enjoyment pathos in the in the vocal expression uh, and for instance she uh, does uh, interesting um, example with the sirens uh, with these mythological uh, wonderful um, uh, beings and uh, but uh, but uh, sees that uh, in the culture uh, it is something fascinating but also dangerous and somehow a bit a bit negative and um, uh, and uh, my doctoral research uh, uh, is called the Human Voice and Instrumental Sound Comparative Study in Timbal Content. Uh, and, uh, and it researches the subject, as I said, uh, of this connection between the spoken language and the instrumental sound. Um, and um, yes, as I said, uh, observing the way of speaking uh, and the body language of, of the speakers and of the players, uh, we, can, we can see there is some parallel. And to do this, uh, I have been doing recording sessions and spectral analysis uh, with um, like uh, some uh, um, uh, musicians that uh, I, I am collaborating with. And uh, for instance, Juha Laitinen, 
the Schlinger and so on, and uh, lately with uh, Maria Ulusari and uh, Annie Egecho, and with Annie we already did a project, so then we will see in a while uh, with the video, and, uh, and she has an interesting background because uh, she, she is a uh, Swedish born, but with a Turkish background. And um, uh, yes, uh, and uh, in this it is very interesting that uh, uh, some parallelism have been drawn uh, uh, between uh, um, uh, language and music in experimental psychology, and for instance in this uh, massive research uh, like uh, done uh, just a year ago, or published a year ago, <laughs> Uh, about the temporal modulations in speech uh, and music, uh, and um, and uh, there is evidence analyzing a uh, very small, um, uh, like data or yeah, uh, excerpt of uh, of uh, sound from very different uh, also uh, music uh, gen. Um, uh, so it's been studied uh, in a way that's true that language and music behave a bit the same way in both. We have sequences of events, uh, and uh, and we um, uh, like analyze or can uh, um, uh, divide then uh, with uh, timing, accent, and grouping. Or the way of thinking is uh, is not so different. And uh, and then of course uh, the rhythm varies across the languages. And uh, and uh, very interesting uh, this in this individual uh, uh, thing. Uh, so so yes, uh, we all we speak at different rates and and we quote pause with different patterns. So so this is uh, uh, like a, a reality. And uh, and then uh, there are in most uh, uh, speech and language uh, there are statistical regularities that uh, they that may may be and. An interesting signal to us to to both. So that's true that these studies uh, focus uh, mainly on uh, on the read question, and it's true that also to um, in the studies uh, mm, done, for instance, uh, uh, to um, recognize like uh, one voice from from another one uh, spoken voice from another, like the rhythm plays an important role. But uh, I am as well interested, or maybe even more interested, in the timbre. Like um, and uh, and then we mm, have to remember that we are in um, in an environment, and uh, and so and uh, I explored this also with the composition uh, uh, with the parameter of the space, and and so um, and so as Damasio said, there is no self without awareness and engagement with others, what what is uh, near us or around us, and then this interaction. And um, and also we have to remember that the perception is uh, multimodal, uh, so that uh, we we don't only have uh, in a concert hall like an or oral experience, but uh, we engage also other senses and uh, it's visual or uh, as also the sense of space and the other other um, all other senses that that we we have and and this also is important in the compositional project that. Uh, I engage with, and uh, because it's an artistic research, we have uh, uh, five doctoral concerts, and um, and uh, two have been realized: our imaginary spaces uh, and uh, voices and spaces. Uh, it was uh, 2016 and 2017, and the next one will be next spring: voice and cello. And uh, in these projects, uh, um, I am interested in a multidimensional non-hierarchic space and in the decentralizing the listening point. Uh, so yes, um, a few examples. Uh, so in the, this imaginary spaces uh, project, uh, uh, it was like a concert installation uh, in a way, um, and um, as you see, the hall was flat, and, and then uh, uh, it was a point that uh, the audience could uh, sit and move around uh, the space uh, more freely uh, compared to a normal concert uh, situation. And, um, and for instance, there were uh, three uh, big parts in the piece, and, uh, and the, the first and the third were played in two different parts of the hall, and uh, then uh, I am collaborating also with Mara Kuchenik for l processed live video. So it was interesting to, to hear the, the first presentation where, where there was also engagement between uh, the musician and, uh, and the artist. 
uh, and here, well, uh, with uh, Maraca uh, does especially like experimental live cinema, so uh, he's uh, more used <laughs> in a way uh, with the moving image to deal with time. And um, yeah, um, and uh, then in this second part uh, of, uh, of the piece, uh, um, th we had also sonic objects uh, um, and, and the, mm, the audience could uh, uh, experiment uh, with them. And uh, so there were different sources, different, mm, um, different, different surfaces, so uh, different uh, materials and um, and so and uh, there were resonances and uh, it was connected also um, to samples of uh, um, uh, spoken voice or yes and uh, yes and the text did like also with uh, with the uh, different interpretations uh, of, uh, of space and um, and and then uh, the next project uh, has been voices and spaces it was more like a, a portrait concert and uh, and so there were mm, like uh, pieces uh, dealing with uh, with voice or spoken voice in different ways because for instance uh, years ago I composed a string quartet uh, based uh, on uh, some uh, studies already of uh, of uh, mm, French formats um, uh, so, so on some vowels. Uh, and uh, even if it is not an elect electronic music piece, it is an, an acoustic piece, but I already had this interest. Uh, and uh, and it, it was French because the, the Fr it was a French string quartet that, uh, that they, uh, that Quatuor Biotima. Um, and, uh, and so, but uh, then uh, there was uh, the new piece uh, composed uh, for this concert. Um, it was uh, uh, the end of no ending. And it is for two um, uh, singers, uh, percussion uh, ensemble, and electronics. And and uh, I chose the, the singers. Uh, um, actually, came across <laughs> some of the collaborations that I had uh, 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 across the years. And uh, and uh, one is uh, Tuli Milleveri, uh, a Finnish soprano, uh, singing a lot of contemporary music and uh, uh, yes, very flexible anyway. And uh, the other one, uh, um, Annie Eilif, uh, as I said before, she has a bit uh, different background and, uh, and uh, she uses her voice very differently. She does also some uh, experimental improvisation and uh, jazz. And, and so I was interested to, to in a way, uh, combine these, uh, these different ways of, of using the voice. And the whole piece is based also on the resonances of uh, percussion instruments, of uh, frame, frame drums, and uh, also on this big frame drum that it is uh, the um, Persian duff. Uh, and it, we had uh, Ahura Hosseini, uh, uh, like uh, yes, an Iranian player playing it. Um, yeah, yes. Well, yes, this is for <laughs> the next, uh, next project. Uh, yes, uh, it will deal uh, then with a smaller ensemble with uh, um, uh, the full ensemble and uh, five musicians, uh, and uh, then uh, there will be like uh, as a soloist uh, Annie, and and she is also a talented cellist, so so uh, it uh, really is uh, is good for collaborating and uh, and for researching this subject. We have been recording together already a couple of times, and I am studying uh, her voice quality, and in the piece uh, there will be a combination of uh, of these two aspects. And uh, now I think we can listen and uh, or we can hear of a summary. Uh, maybe we can turn the lights uh, off. Just wait a second. Yeah. It's not on this screen. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Mm -hmm. 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 Mm -hmm
stuff. Um, or what you find with the lights that yeah there was no time to see this oh sorry <laughs> a bit pity that uh, uh, because in this piece as you saw there was a for instance, uh, three uh, points in the hall where the instruments were uh, placed, uh, and also the two singers they were uh, sitting and uh, like uh, sitting in different uh, positions in the hall. And, and then there is a like part where um, or part of more parts <laughs> where uh, also the the uh, singers will move in the space and uh, interact, and, and uh, so so yes, there are. I study some trajectories and uh, and it also then there is also spatialization of the sound uh, like uh, over a system of eight plus triggers and and so on but uh, uh, maybe just to conclude yes here you find <laughs> some of my contacts and um, and uh, yes the research is supported by Finnish cultural foundation and but thank you <laughs>also but uh, or I inv investigated the question a bit uh, from two different perspectives in, in these projects because in the first one also there was not much time to show but uh, but uh, yes uh, I recorded like as I said different texts uh, uh, that uh, have to do with space and different concepts of space and then uh, I worked on on that and uh, and then there was this also this bodily relation uh, with uh, with the voice because uh, some of these sounds were contained somehow in these uh, in these boxes and instruments and so on and uh, yeah and uh, there were like multiple layers of bit of experience with the uh, with the spoken voice and uh, and then in the in this uh, second project uh, uh, yeah it was more uh, the relation also of the voice to the instrument and to the whole structure because then uh, uh, there, uh, there was a, a human voice exciting these uh, frame drums and uh, and then uh, I studied and used the resonance, these resonances to build to build uh, the, the whole piece. But it's true, like uh, then uh, in this uh, third project, uh, there would be more close relation between like the the voice of it, and, and then it would be the okay. possibility of having one some player uh, that uh, is going to speak and uh, and uh, sing and uh, have the instrument at, at the same time. Do we have another questions? If no, thank you very much. Thank you. And I would like to present the very last uh, presenter of the session, Anna Rutkowska, with her lecture recital, The Influence of the Culture, Tradition and Arts of Japan on Contemporary Marimba Literature by Japanese composers Kiko Abe, Minoru Miki and Akira Miyoshi. Anna is from Academy of Music in Krakow. And they will be uh, playing together with Juliana Siedler Smugel uh, with the percussion as the Virginia. Yes.
Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to introduce myself. My name is Anna Rutkowska. I got the PhD last year in Academy of Music in Krakow. My topic uh, of the thesis was the influence of culture, tradition, and arts of Japan on contemporary marimba music by Japanese composers uh, Keiko Abe, Minoru Miki, and Akira Miyoshi. I would like to uh, show you my presentation from the thesis in a shorter version. And uh, in my performance, you, you will hear three pieces, um, which will kind of depict in sound uh, different approaches uh, to <coughs> Japanese contemporary marimba music. Uh, the motivation for the topic um, and the choice of the topic was mainly based on the evolution of marimba as a solo instrument worldwide. Um, also, uh, because nowadays marimba is getting more and more attention, we could observe increasing um, interest in marimba playing and music among students uh, around the world. I also really had this need to understand what actually I should feel and experience during, during um, Japanese music performance, because still uh, in European culture we have totally different approach to music than in Asia. Also the motivation was the awareness of implementing the aesthetic ideas while performance. Main objective of my thesis were to present Japanese cultural influences and uh, here we have the pieces that uh, are included in my presentation. Voice of Matsuri Drums by, by Keiko Abe, Marimba Spiritual Part 1 by Minoru Miki and Ripple by Akira Miyoshi. I wanted to highlight differences between European and Jap Japanese aesthetics and introduce uh, Japanese contemporary composers connected with the marimba world. And uh, in the last chapter of my thesis, I just discussed performance aspects of chosen marim marimba pieces. My thesis um, consisted of three chapters. First was devoted to uh, culture, tradition, and arts of Japan. Second one devoted to the birthplace, Japan as a birthplace of marimba contemporary music. And last chapter was devoted to performance, uh, uh, performance ideas concerning chose mar chosen marimba pieces. In the first chapter, I focused mostly on the history and arts, tradition and culture. In this triptych, we can see the birth of music. The figure on the top of this picture is uh, the goddess Amaterasu, the goddess of sun and uh, the rays of sun also are visible in the Japanese flag. And this scene presents uh, actually the birth of music. So we can see Amaterasu hidden in a cave, actually going out of the cave because he, she heard the music and dance presented by another goddess, um, Amano no Ozube, to just uh, the, the order of the dance was to get Amaterasu out of the cave because she had this argument with her brother, the god of uh, storm, and she decided to hide herself in a cave to let the world be, uh, just stay in darkness. So actually the music brought uh, light again to marimba, uh, to, to Japanese world, and this is the main idea of ar arising uh, music in Japan. We had, uh, like, of course, many historical periods and there are different characteristic uh, things happening uh, in each period. Uh, I would mm, like to um, focus about on Kofun period, when uh, people used to, oh, it was already in our era, 
So people used to make uh, clay figures just depicting um, different professions and by that one also people, well, people found out that the figures would also present musical uh, professions. Um, my main focus actually in this uh, chapter was devoted to aesthetics because like I said before, in our Euro European uh, approach to music uh, we have completely different idea, I would say, from my, per no, from, from my Polish perspective. So the perfection in music performance and in music pieces. And actually what I found in Japan is uh, that actually the it's completely opposite. That beauty is found in things that are not perfect, like um, they are really elegant, they are melancholic, and they show also noble poverty and uh, mysterious depth and charm and shape. We've got this uh, vocabulary, so Miyabi stands for elegance, Awa Aware stands for melancholy, Sabi, mellowness and imperfection, Wabi, noble poverty, Yugen, mysterious depth, and Iki, charm and shape. Uh, in the music that I'm going to perform today, there is a very important concept of Ma, which stands for actually in my perception that would be silence, but again in Japanese perception, ma describes space around objects and in music it stands for, for space around the sounds. It is a sphere where the sounds come from and hide back, hide back again, like it happens in the waves uh, in the ocean. Ma describes neither time nor space itself. It refers to the tension building up in silence around the objects or sounds. In European approach, that would probably be translated into the idea of the pause, silence and rest, maybe fermata. And actually what we, we've been taught for ages, it has some certain length. Another idea of the uh, mm, aesthetic mm, concept is kontetsu. Uh, the concept uh, invented by Minoru Miki, one of the composers that, that um, I wrote about, I've written about, and it stands for a cultural blend. Uh, the idea is clearly noticeable in Japanese composers' music, representing different trends and stylistics. Apart from Eastern inspirations, Japanese music presents elements deriving from Western cu cultures, especially that was visible after Second World War when American uh, Americans would stay in Japan and bring all the American culture uh, to the islands. Uh, in the music, uh, for example, in the scores of Marimba Spiritual that we are going to perform today, we have this um, westernization aspect that the composer gives us a hint to make the instrumentation easier because um, not every time we can use traditional Japanese instruments like taiko or hymns or other, other uh, ceremonial instruments. And we have alternative instrumentation. We can use our European drums and um, other instruments. And also the composer gives us uh, the hint about precise articulation and uh, indication about the rests. There is a really nice um, description by the anthropologist, American anthropologist Ruth Benedict that describes the um, idea of how, how we should perceive Japanese as a culture. So Japanese are both aggressive and unaggressive, both militaristic and aesthetic, both insolent and polite, rigid and adaptable, submissive and resentful of being pushed around, loyal and treacherous, brave and timid, conservative and hospitable to new ways. In Japanese art, we can also find many um, beautiful um, genres actually of arts. So we've got paintings and craftwork, music, drama, ceremonies, and art and tradition. So each of, uh, for example, in ceremonies, what I also found translated in music, each of action that actually could be performed every day, like for example, making the tea, comes to the uh, level of the ceremony. We've got shodo as a calligraphy, chado as a tea ceremony, kendo as the sword, Actually, the way, the do stands for the way, so the way of the sword. Then do stands for the tradition which is passes through the generations. Uh, 
got some examples, of course, of the art. And what comes also to tradition, of course, we've got the music. And the music evolved through ages. And at the beginning, it derived from the Chinese and Korean music. The oldest Japanese genres are gagaku, orchestral folk music, and shomyo, ritual vocal Buddhist chant. And we have here also the examples of traditional uh, music scales, ryo, ritsu, yo. This is the first scale. So in the pieces that also we are going to uh, play to you today, we've got the marimba spiritual, which is based mostly on a Buddhist chant. And this is a short example. So it is only vocal music. present in the compositions today is the music of no theater so you can see it here this is the ensemble called Hayashi and this music usually accompanies the theatrical plays in the no theater apart from instrumental parts played on drums and uh, flute hichiriki we've got kind of um, vocal, not shouts, yeah, maybe you could say it like this, uh, called kakegoi. There is also court music, which is purely instrumental. Gagaku. So in this uh, ensemble we can see string instruments like tokos, uh, wind instruments here in the back, flutes, ryu, teki, hichiriki, and kind of mouth organ called sho, string instrument diwa, and the drums kakko, gaku daiko, and the gong shoko. It's very, really, I would say, contemplative as well. So, and uh, the last example is from the kabuki theater. The ensemble is bigger. Japan is the birthplace of contemporary solo marimba music and I think that there are people who will agree but maybe not everyone would agree with that but uh, um, my role model is in music is Keiko Abe who is still a performer and a composer and she was the one to commission first marimba pieces written by uh, composers in the 50s so people by that, uh, that time were of course um, inspired by Schoenberg's 12-tone scales and uh, Webern, Berg, Stockhausen, Messiaen and Boulez. They had great, the composers had great interest in electronic music, of course. Um, in Japan, new music societies were created. They held workshops and competitions. So all got some movement towards just um, being at the same level of mm, musical per perception as Europe and, of course, America. Uh, the most famous composers we can um, include Eirin no Shibata no Maizumi, Miki Takemitsu, Ichi, Ichi Yanagi and Maki Ishii. In 1957, as you can see, Toru Takemitsu wrote a Requiem for the Strings and also really um, popular piece by that time was Nirvana Symphony. 
And uh, these compositions also included the inspirations from the religion, from the ceremonies, uh, like from the Japanese culture. So in marimba music, uh, I found, um, I divided uh, inspirations into three parts. Eastern inspiration, so deriving from Japan. So we, we can see here a tonality and uh, using a full scale of the instrument, the unique approach to dissonance, because in, of course, in Europe for ages, you know, dissonance would stand for something from out of the w this world, something even dev devilish, but now in, uh, in, in Japan, it stands for par paranormal element, but in a good sense. And especially it's visible in no theater. We've got extreme dynamics um, in the music. There's a creating, creating and releasing musical tension. Of course, Ma concept is um, present and there is polyphony and multi-layered way of uh, creating the music. Western, indi Western inspirations are also present. There are composers who write in this style. So it, it is mostly tonal music and um, really light coming from the piano. No, for presentation. Okay, okay. So, I'm a bit good. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, I said before, uh, Keiko Abe was uh, is still like our legend of, of the marimba. She's been the composer, she's been the performer, and um, she's been the one to actually create the first uh, recital of uh, marimba in Tokyo, in Japan, in 1967, and got into the cooperation with uh, the composers to um, write more pieces for marimba solo and an ensemble. She writes in a way, uh, like in ch her music is just cherishing the nature. She improvises and it, you can find really natural um, way of improvisation when you watch her or listen to her. And in her pieces also you can find um, <coughs> really char characteristic um, polyphony and interweaving of the motifs. She wrote like a lot of music, usually the music which was written for Marimba Solo was later on adapted to ensemble pieces. We've got Minoru Miki, who was the one to um, uh, found the Pro Musica Nipponia Ensemble, which is the contemporary music ensemble performing on the traditional instruments. It's a, actually the orchestra. So uh, he stayed also in the cooperation with Keiko Abe and wrote a really famous time for Marimba, which is devoted to gamelan music from Java. Um, oh yeah, uh, he also uh, talked about westernization and konketsu, wrote a lot of pieces of course. <laughs> Akira Miyoshi is the third composer and he is like the most um, contemporary I would say. He, uh, in his music we will find some influences from the traditional music but in the piece that I'm going to play today for you we can find this n not really spiritual way but uh, like this kind of extreme presentation of the approach to tempo and dyna dynamics. Voice of Matsuri Dance by Keiko Abe is really characteristic because uh, the piece is uh, performed with two mallets specially made for this piece. Uh, so on the top of the stick we have uh, kind of a pillow shaped head and on the other side of the mallet we have the, uh, it should be rubber ball, <coughs> the shaft should be also really, uh, I mean, suggested that it should be um, thicker. It should resemble the rhythmics of Matsuri drums playing. And it consists also of Yukichi traditional rhythm, which is also like, uh, you can find it in the traditional music. Marimba Spiritual is a piece consisting of two parts. First one is like a ki it's kind of a requiem in slow tempo and the other one is like a resurrection and the first part refers to Shomyo Buddhi Buddhist chants and uses also traditional temple instruments uh, from the Buddhist temples and the last piece uh, Ripple uh, for solo marimba by Akira Miyoshi Ripple uh, in its name refers to splash murmur of the brook but the composer himself said that he wanted to um, present the movement of lava underneath the Japanese islands because Japan islands are located in a really not in not 
the best um, part of the world. So they have, of course, problems with earthquakes and other calamities, like right now there's some typhoon going on. So it has an organic structure of four different sections interweaved ataka. Uh, presented here, we've got the spreading motif, we've got the corale, we've got scherzo, and uh, part with kakegoe sharps. So the conclusion is that I found, of course, some influences of culture, of Japanese culture in the pieces, but of course, this is not the on only one uh, material that the composers were basing, uh, that the compo composers were, were using, of course, in, uh, in, in the compositions. Traditional music has been uh, an inspiration and aesthetics, of course, of Japan. Um, the composers gave, gave me uh, direct suggestions and I did evaluation on the pieces myself. Um, original Japanese means of means of expression are, uh, means of expression are present in various skills of Japanese art, and compositions of my choice present various themes and shows the correlation between the culture, tradition, and arts, and were confir confirmed by Keiko Abe herself and by other performance performers who perform in Japanese mainland music. Thank you so much for your attention, and now we will move to the practical part.
thank you very much. We have still time for one, two questions. If you have, please. Yeah, thank you for a great uh, lecture and great playing in the performance. Uh, impressive. Uh, I might be one of those non-believers, maybe on the chamber music story, but uh, I'm not going to dive into that. There's obviously more into that material. I was just wondering if, if we take that for granted that marimba music as a chamber music or a of the chamber music and solo music from marimba, is, do you think that there is again like a feedback influence in the other marimba solo music like uh, well i know the french guys Jurel Matalo on the roof oh, yeah, or yeah. mantovani or even the drug one or stuff so, like uh, that so the question is about if japanese music influenced well other if people. you take for granted that it originated somehow no in no, that no way. i don't i don't okay. because also parallelly it was happening all over the world yeah. i'm just like a fan of japanese music you know i cannot state that this is okay. like this and that's it you know? but and then next do you think it, it somehow influenced back into it? Because those pieces are later probably yeah. and some of you... I, I you think have. that people were kind of... I, I think that most of the composers had a chance to listen to, to these yeah. music. And uh, yeah, for example, like in Bruckmann's uh, Reflections on the Nature of Water, we, we have this topic of nature, we have water, we have all those uh, natural things going on and sounds of nature. So I, I would say yes, but not 100%. Because as I said, everything happened parallelly. Okay. Yeah. Yes, one of the more question. Uh, is it necessary to uh, live in Japan and speak the language to understand this uh, kind of music? I haven't been to Japan. Oh. I just got in touch with, with Keiko Abe and that was my life goal because actually, <laughs> yeah, it, it's not that easy to go and uh, for me. Uh, but I found a way to, to kind of cooperate with the composer herself. So that was my main goal for years and I started to learn a little bit of Jap Japanese and got in touch with many people, contacted conservatories and I think wh if you are really interested in a topic that there is no such need but th that should happen at some point to visit the country and, and just fulfill somehow, you know, and be completed in, in the research and ideas. And the questions, any more questions? If not, uh, I would like to thank you for your attention. We are uh, ending this session and the next one will, will start half past 12, so you still have a short break. <laughs>